Okay, specificity part two. This time without pointing out the ridiculous inadequacies of other people in this fitness industry. So the basic summary of part one regarding specificity and said is that specificity says that you should choose the activity you're going to do based on what you want to get better at. And said specific adaptations to impose demands says that the adaptation that you see will be specific to the imposed demands. And I gave some general examples in terms of, I talked about energy production pathways and concentric isometric eccentric training. I talked about lengthened isometrics versus shortened isometrics. I gave a few examples just to give a general idea of that. So I may have given the idea at this point that everything must be specific. Anything non-specific, meaning not the activity you want to improve, will not improve it at all, and that there is no carryover or crossover, and that's not true. In many cases, there will be cross-adaptations to a limited degree. No one would debate that the best way to get better at X is to do X and not Y, and vice versa. And there's a famous story, Abijayev, who took Olympic lifting to its logical specificity and extreme, supposedly said, you don't get better at the violin by practicing the flute, which is probably apocryphal, but it kind of sums this up. However, as the title card said, specificity is not absolute. And here are a few random examples. In rank beginners, totally untrained, aerobic training can often cause a slight increase in muscle mass. There's also an oddity with aerobic training because of the nature of the adaptations. You often will see, depending on what's done, a decrease in type 2 muscle fiber size and an increase in type 1 fiber size, which has to do with the specific adaptations, but I want to get, again, into the weeds on that. But in beginners, aerobic training, because it is a tension stimulus, albeit low level, may cause a little bit of muscle growth. There have been some weird recent fucking studies trying to mimic the old uh, quail stretch models, where they do shit like put the calves on stretch for one hour, six days a week in a painful boot, and they are seeing some growth. Now, it's not much better than just doing three sets of 12 to 15, but extreme stretching, extreme long duration stretching can cause growth because it's generating mechanical tension. Stretching for 15 seconds won't do shit. And fun fact, doing a length and partial or holding the bottom position for a second on an extreme stretch exercise isn't stretch media to hypertrophy morons. Back in the day, weight training was thought to make people muscle bound and lose flexibility. But if you do proper weight training through a full range of motion, that can increase muscle flexibility and joint mobility. Although there's a little bit of a catch 22, to be able to squat deep enough to increase hip mobility requires the hip mobility to squat deep enough. But, but what you could do in this case is do a squat to the limits of your hip mobility, relax into it to get a little bit more stretch, and over time you can increase the depth of your squatting while improving hip mobility because you're getting a specific adaptation to that imposed demand. There are also studies where they will have runners do heavyweight training or jumping drills because running is... There's an elastic component, there's a little bit of, there's a plyometric component that involves the stretch shorten cycle, and they may see increases in exercise efficiency. Questionable if that actually increases performance. And as an interesting note, early running coaches, and even the Kenyans, get that explosive work by doing bounding, basically doing explosive running. Because even if there's crossover from that relatively less specific weight training, you still get better adaptations from doing specific explosive running. Hmm. So there can be cross adaptations. And I'm sure to a very limited degree, maximal sprinting can increase maximal strength. Although the whole don't, I don't want to get into the train like a sprinter, look like a sprinter because all sprinters lift weights if they're built like that in genetics. But, but whatever, my point of this all being that specificity is not absolute, especially in the early stages. As you get more well-trained, it does become more and more and more absolute, right? Once you're past the beginner stage, running is not going to build muscle. And once you're a high-level runner, dicking about in the weight room is not likely to make you a better runner. And the best runners on the planet, the Kenyans, don't lift weights. They run, and they run, and they fucking run some more. 
A cyclist essentially do nothing but ride a bike. I mean, and inject EPO. The best swimmers do nothing but swim, although swimming has always had dry land, which could be weight training or tubing. Uh, swimming is, is complicated. So at the higher levels, even if other training is done, the predominant training is always specific because all that nonspecific stuff becomes relatively less and less and less contributory. Because even when there is crossover, even when there can be a little bit of cross adaptation, specificity will still ruin the rule supreme in that you will always get better doing X or get better at X doing X than you will get better at Y doing X or get better at X doing Y. So there are a couple reasons that are worth, I think, discussing about why cross adaptation can occur. Now, in the previous video, I sort of, I, I, I described specificity and said a little bit differently, which was that the system that adapts whether at the micro or the mid or that, or sorry, the macro or the mid or that micro level, will be the one that is physiologically stressed, which is what stimulates the adaptation, however it's stimulated. But that said, I can't think of any, I mean, maybe one or two exceptions where any type of training, any type of activity is not stressing more than one system, right? Running does require muscle tension, albeit low levels. Cycling requires muscle tension. If you've ever done a hill climb, frequently it's quite a bit. It's not nearly the same as doing a triple in the squat, but it requires muscular tension. When you're doing resistance training exercises through a full range of motion, obviously that's going to uh, stress the systems that are involved in flexibility and mobility, and I'll talk about some of those in here in just a second. I just want to speak generally here. Right, because the muscle has to go through a full range of motion. So all the components involved in it doing that, from the muscle itself, fascia, connective tissue, all the little interconnected bits are going to be stressed. Now, maybe not to the same degree as they would be stressed in extreme yoga, but they will be stressed. When you are doing heavy resistance training, you are stressing tendons, ligaments, bone, and you may see adaptations there in addition to the primary adaptation. And again, this all depends on exactly what's being done. Like for example, bone mineral density is best stimulated actually with high impact jumping and sprinting. That's what stimulates bone. Olympic lifting is next because it's got a very high peak force, that big explosion with the catch. Power lifting is next. It's a much heavier force, but it's not a high peak force. And then you get to running and walking, which have no high peak forces and do shit for bone mineral density unless you're severely, severely osteoporotic. And then you've got cycling and swimming that are anti-gravity, which can actually cause bone mineral density loss because it's putting zero stress on the bones. So I mentioned previously that when you're talking about endurance performance, the determinants of aerobic adaptations are heart, blood volume, hematocrit, capillary density, uh, mitochondria, enzyme activity. I left out the brain and I'll come back to that here in just a second. Any activity that is aerobic in nature, that is long duration endurance, is going to stress all of those systems to one degree, although it may stress one or more to a greater degree than others. So that's reason number one why there's some cross adaptation. In terms of exceptions to this, off the top of my head, the only one I can really think of is using an, an EMS electrical muscle stimulator that is applied at the motor nerve and fires the muscle without involving the brain, without involving the nervous system, since it's typically an isometric contraction, there's no stretch, there's no impact on bone mineral density. That's the only one that, that I can think of that, that would be completely specific to that one system though. But everything else, any activity you do is going to stress more than one system. So you will see proportionally more or less adaptations in those systems, depending on how much it stresses them. Again, specificity, the primary system that adapts will be in response to the primary stimulus, but there can be cross adaptations to one degree or another. Then we can get a little bit deeper to this and we'll look a little more at the deeper physiological, that mid-level of adaptation that occurs. There are overlapping systems in the body such that if we move to that mid-level, 
uh, of adaptations that I talked about. Any given type of training will, yes, have the biggest effect on the one that you're training, but that doesn't mean it'll have zero effect on anything else. So for example, here was the summary of physiological energy systems within skeletal muscle, right? So we've got ATP, CP system lasts about one to 10 seconds of maximal activity. Anaerobic glycolysis predominates at 30 to 60 up to about 90 seconds. The aerobic system really takes over at two minutes, but really becomes dominant, really dominant at 20 minutes plus, and then some distinguish that, that aerobic glycolytic and aerobic lipolytic system. And these systems don't work in complete isolation, right? It is, we think of it as one, two, three, but it's really a continuum, and I'm going to spare you the, the curve of how this works, where one predominates. But when you're training, say, the ATP-CP system with repeat short sprints, depending on what kind of rest interval you use, whether it's full, complete, or incomplete, you may start to stress the anaerobic glycolytic system. So you may see some adaptation there. Not to mention from a performance standpoint, the longer you can utilize ATP-CP, yeah, that, the later the glycolytic system will come in. So it may indirectly improve performance, simply by delaying when you start producing those acidic waste products. When you're doing anaerobic glycolytic work, which tends to be high intensity, short duration intervals, depending on the interval, it may still put some stress on the ATP-CP system. You may see some slight adaptations there. Also, it's not like you can separate that from the aerobic system. Even at 90 seconds, the aerobic system starts to be stressed. And again, depending on whether you use complete or incomplete rest intervals, you may start to see stress in the aerobic system. The systems and the aerobic system because the way that workout is set up. So you end up having an effect on both. So the anaerobic glycolytic training may stress both to some degree. And if you've been following these videos, I mentioned the Tabata protocol many videos back, which is a, a, you do eight repeats of 20 seconds all out, which is somewhere between ATP, CP and anaerobic glycolysis with a 10 second break. And as a consequence of that, you actually stress both the anaerobic glycolytic the aerobic system does influence the anaerobic system in that the more developed the aerobic system, the better your body can deal with waste products, the less it needs to rely on those anaerobic glycolytic processes. So if you're doing aerobic work, you may see some adaptations, but you won't see adaptations in the ATP-CP system. It's only one less. Even that distinction between aerobic glycolytic and aerobic lipolytic has to do more with proportions, right? When you're even at the two hour mark, you may be relying predominantly more on muscle, on carbohydrate, blood glucose, and muscle glycogen, but you're still using fat for fuel. And then at the two hour mark, you start to use relatively more fat for fuel and less glucose. So it's not like those systems aren't impacting one another. They are specific, but there will be carryover. And I think what you could pretty much say is that any given system in that chart will have predominantly an effect on its own level and affect one level below and one level above. So aerobic lipolytic will do nothing for ATP-CP. It will do nothing for anaerobic glycolysis because that's two levels below. Anaerobic glycolysis will affect both ATP-CP and aerobic to one degree or another. And aerobic glycolytic will impact anaerobic glycolytic and aerobic lipolytic. That makes sense? Okay. You can even take that as a physiological uh, realm into that macro level and, and, and specific types of training. If you look at, you know, endurance training, it's typically, you know, zone one, zone two, zone three, or sometimes you see five zones, depending on how it's divided up and based on the physiology and the energetic pathways, the durations. And basically what you find is that any given zone of training, say zone two, will have a little bit of, mainly affect zone two, but it'll improve zone one and zone three. Zone three will improve zone two and zone four. Zone four will improve zone three and zone five, and zone five will improve zone four. So it's always, it'll go one, one higher and one lower, but really have no effect outside of that. We talk more about hypertrophy training or the type, resistance training adaptations. Right within skeletal muscle, you've got the contractile components of muscle fibers. You've got the connective tissues. You've got the energetic systems that are involved in, you know, glycogen stores and enzymes and mitochondria, which is just generally called the sarcoplasm. And those all contribute to the different adaptations we see. It's resistance training, which I'm going to generally delineate as maximal strength. It's the ability to generate maximal force. Muscle hypertrophy increases in muscle size, which we can then separate into sarcoplasmic and myofibrillar and muscular endurance, local muscular endurance.
which has to do with how well skeletal muscle can contract in over long durations in the face of fatigue. And as I'll talk about more in part three when I talk about specifics of resistance training, we typically have delineated training differently for each of those components, right? Maximal strength training, heavy fives with near maximal weights. That predominantly stresses myofibril, the, the actual muscle fibers, but it also stresses the nervous system, which I mentioned. But it's not like it doesn't stress any other system, right? Lots of sets of low repetitions, triples and fives, can cause muscle hypertrophy if you do enough of them and get enough high tension contractions. We move to myofibrillar hypertrophy training, actually increasing the size of the muscle fibers. The type of training that does that tends to be higher tension moderate repetition ranges generally, it's not like that doesn't increase maximal strength, depending on the type of training, right? Sets of six to eight will stress be closer to maximal strength than sets of 12 to 15, and it will stress the system differently. So you may see increases in both muscle size, but also maximal strength, although to a lesser degree than if you did heavy triples. Sarcoplasmic hypertrophy, is more about stressing the energetic system, glycogen, mitochondria, all of that shit, increasing the sarcoplasm. But it's not like that type of training doesn't involve the myofibrils. It's still high, it's still muscular contractions. So it's not like you ever, ever, ever see solely myofibrillar versus sarcoplasmic hypertrophy. In beginners, you see them both about the same time, which is where the idea that sarcoplasmic doesn't exist comes from, but in advanced, you see relatively one or the other. But the type of training that generates sarcoplasmic hypertrophy won't do shit for maximal strength, because it's typically lighter, higher repetition, and shorter rest. It's not heavy enough. And then typical muscular endurance training is very high repetitions, frequent on a short rest period. And physiologically, this is forcing the muscle to make lots of lower level muscular contractions. Since the sets are longer, it generates more waste products, so you're exposing it so that the adaptation is to be able to better buffer changes in H plus levels and, and all that acidotic end products and stuff like that. That's what increases muscular endurance. Now, we know that that can stimulate hypertrophy taken to failure because the last five reps are extremely high tension contractions, but we also know that it doesn't increase maximal strength or certainly not anywhere close to the level that just about any other heavier training would. It just doesn't require the same muscular and especially neurological demands to need to do that. It probably also increases sarcoplasmic hypertrophy because it's stressing the energetic system. So once again, you see there is physiological overlap where each type of training will generally predominantly cause its own adaptation, but impact the one above it and the one below it. So maximal strength training, can generate hypertrophy, will not generate sarcoplasmic growth, will not improve muscular endurance, period, because it doesn't stress either of those systems. Okay, since someone will get shitty with me in the comments, maximal strength training can indirectly alter muscular endurance for reasons that I'm not going to go into, but it's an indirect effect, and that has to do with you're using relative or absolute loading. Spare me the pedantry, you know what I'm trying to fucking say. Typical lower repetition hypertrophy work, depending on how it's done, can increase maximal strength in both myofibril or predominantly in sarcoplasmic hypertrophy. Sarcoplasmic hypertrophy training will increase myofibril or training, one above, but not maximal strength, and muscular endurance. Muscular endurance, again, can increase growth. It gets more complicated. It's maybe too below, but it won't increase maximal strength. It's a similar thing. Again, there is no type of training that will solely stimulate a single system, so there's always going to be overlap. That's part of why you will see cross adaptations. Specificity still holds, but that doesn't mean that that's the only adaptation that you get. Another factor to consider is that when you're looking at the different adaptations to training, there are both central and peripheral adaptations, and I'll describe that here in a second. So for example, in endurance sports, Back in the day, they would test endurance athletes and do a VO2 max test. It's just they ramp them up intensity to see how much oxygen they can use. And they didn't really pay much attention to what was being done. Usually it was either a bike or a treadmill test based on what the lab had. And then at some point, someone got the idea to go, well, let, why don't we test different athletes on each? And so if you trust, test a cyclist on the bike, they will get about a 10% or so VO2 max, higher VO2 max score than if you make them run. And if you test a runner 
on a treadmill, they'll get about a 10% higher VO2 max than on a bike. And swimmers do okay on both, and you have to get really convoluted to come up with swimming VO2 max tests for its, its, its own thing. The point being that, yes, specificity holds, but it's not like runners get zero VO2 max scores or terrible on, on cycling. They simply get better in the one they're better at. And some of this is due to specificity. So if you're talking about endurance adaptations, right, I mentioned heart, so the lungs don't really adapt in terms of stroke volume, blood volume, hematocrits, capillaries are right on the edge, but, but those first three are really the central adaptations, how much oxygen you can actually move. Those adapt to any endurance training, you do. Whether you ride a bike, run, the elliptical EFX, rowing, whatever it is, if you're stressing the heart and the blood system and the hematocrit and oxygen availability, those systems will adapt. No matter what, your body doesn't care. The differences between the sports are in the peripheral adaptations, both the specific muscles that get targeted, because cycling tends to use more quads and glutes, and, and running tends to be more calves and hamstrings, so that's part of it. Um, there's also the neuromuscular patterns in terms of getting efficient, not that the most endurance sports are particular. Well, those two aren't very complicated. Um, with running, especially, there are a lot of conne connective tissue adaptations. The Achilles tendon gets springier, probably those intramuscular connective tissues, is part of why runners continue to get better uh, at running even after they're physiological. And, and cyclists won't have that. And this is why Lance Armstrong, despite dominating the Tour de France, when he tried to become a marathon runner, was I mean, he was decent, but he wasn't great. He had the central motor. He didn't have the peripheral adaptations. Now, if you're talking about weight training activities or sprinting, it's, it's not quite the same as you don't really have those cardiac adaptations. However, the brain is a big one as far as central adaptations. And this is true for endurance and the strength sports because signals are sent from the motor cortex, from the brain, down the motor neurons to the muscle. And there is no singular type of, say, weight training. There's no type of training, period, except maybe electrostim that won't involve the nervous system to one degree or another. Now, how it involves it will depend. Riding a bike versus running versus sprinting versus weightlifting versus Olympic lifting and the types of signals. But you cannot separate the nervous system from any sort of training. And this is relevant, those of you who are more familiar with, with weight training, right? We've typically said with it, like low rep, high, you know, Fives and lowers at 85% to 100% of max are neural training, whereas 8 to 12 is hypertrophy training, and 20 to 25 is muscular endurance training. But it's not like, as the pedants will point out, they all involve the nervous system, but it's how they involve them. When you're using maximal weights, different sets of signals in terms of fiber recruitment, rate coding, doublets, intramuscular and intramuscular coordination, all this neuromuscular shit is going to be different than if you're doing a set of 25 to failure. On top of the local metabolic stress, the peripheral stress, there's a big, I don't know, well, it's not even recent, 10, 20 years ago, Tim Noakes, before he lost his goddamn mind and became a keto zealot, brought up the issue of the central governor, right? For decades, fatigue during exercise was thought to be peripheral in the skeletal muscle. And he pointed out that, well, yeah, but ultimately it comes into the brain, right? This is the whole idea that pain is, pain is only in the brain, which is, Matrix level 10 philosophy and is true, but isn't, that's a whole separate video. I agree up to a point, but I also disagree, right? The periphery sends signals to the brain. The brain interprets those. And where the central governor comes in is it sort of decides when to shut things down. Good example, if core body temperature gets too high, the brain senses that and it will, you, you basically undergo catastrophic failure. The body shuts the, the brain will shut the body down so that you don't die, basically, get the heat stroke and stuff like that. And some drugs can overcome that. For example, ADHD drugs let you push past that because they're affecting neurochemistry. But some of those peripheral, ad the central adaptations in the central governor, in how we perceive painful stimuli, can be generalized because those central adaptations are very general. The peripheral are very specific. So as a real world example, Charlie Francis, when he was bringing his sprinters into competition, talked about using a heavy, short weight training workout two days before the sprint event. And he was doing that to tune the nervous system. 
because maximal weight training and maximal sprinting have similar neurological demands. With my powerlifters, I always have them do short meat prep for similar reasons, but he was using it in a non-specific, but it was centrally specific in terms of the brain was just having to exert a maximal effort, and he used it to tune his athletes without having to run them and put them at risk for injury. So there's a good example of how that central system can be involved into related but still distinct activities. So as an example, I did so much endurance training, so much lactate threshold work, so much interval work when I was younger, when I was skating. I have, well, had an incredible pain threshold. And some of that is peripheral adaptation, but some of that is the brain. Learning to handle pain, how you perceive it, that's where the pain is on the brain stuff comes from. If you get bored, go look into the psychobiosocial model of pain that simply says that the signal sent from the periphery will have relatively greater or lesser degrees of perceived pain for any given individual based on psychological factors, whether it's cultural, upbringing, whatever it is, if you get bored. Back to the topic. And that carried over to other activities. So I could do high rep squatting. I mean, it hurts, but I can push myself further. And that is a learned thing. You can get central adaptations. And to a degree, they generalize. So that's another reason there can be these cross adaptations, that all types of training will generally have some type of central stimulus that will carry over to all related activities. But it will also have the peripheral adaptations which will tend to be a fuckload more specific, which brings me into another concept. So all of that mess leads into another concept that I'm only gonna mention very briefly here because I'm gonna give them more details in, in the final, in part three of this video, which is the idea of transfer of training, right? So obviously doing X makes you better at X, but has some carryover to Y, Z, Z prime, depending on uh, reasons. Transfer simply refers to the idea that any non-specific activity may transfer. Performance is usually what's being talked about, but we can look at the underlying physiology in either a positive, neutral, or negative manner. So positive means that if you're trying to improve X and you do Y, and improving Y improves X, that's positive transfer. And I realize I'm being necessarily vague, but this is just concept. Neutral means there's no transfer. Right, so you're trying to improve X and you do Y and Y gets better and X doesn't change, that's neutral transfer. And there's negative transfer where you're trying to improve X and if Y improves, X gets worse. So some just completely random examples. And this is probably usually more applied to like weight room stuff, performance, and more anaerobic than endurance type stuff, right? If you ever have the misfortune of reading some of those European and the Russian translation, and especially Bondarchuk's awful transfer of training, there's just, there's charts and stats of this exercise has this statistical relationship to this exercise and, and this stuff. I mean, probably an easier example, Westside Barbell, who used a lot of assistance movements for the main competition exercises, squat, bench, deadlift. And they would, if they found that, that this exercise, like a heavy good morning, that if that went up, their competition squat went up, well, that's positive transfer. That's the easiest example I can give, right? Now, it might not be one-to-one. -one. It's not like you add 10 pounds to your good morning and your back squat goes up by 10 pounds, but there is a relationship. And I found that when I trained Sumi for powerlifting. Uh, I did, she did a lot of assistance work, and I found the ones that transferred to her competition movements. And I knew that if this movement and this movement and this movement had improved, that she had potential improvement in her squat. And I'll explain potential in part three. So that's positive transfer. Neutral transfer just means exactly that, right? Maybe you picked the wrong assistance exercise in the weight room. The Olympic lifts, right? Olympic lifters would be like, ah, I need to drive up my squat poundages to improve my clean and jerk. And they, they put 50 pounds on their squat and their clean and jerk doesn't improve. That's neutral transfer. There's just no benefit. And then finally, there's negative transfer, like I said, where improving Y actually harms performance in, in what you're trying to improve. And frequently this occurs when you're, when you're looking at activities that are very um, at odds with one another, 
So for example, lots of long duration endurance training, which tells the muscles to become smaller and more efficient, tends to have negative transfer for say, maximum strength production. There's a reason power lifters don't do a lot of aerobic activity. So that would be negative transfer. Back in the day when the Soviets were doing tons and tons and tons of research on this, they found that driving the overhead press too high actually gave people a worse jerk. There was negative transfer. And what determines whether there's transfer depends on a lot of variables. And again, I'll give some more specific examples um, later on. But again, when you're looking at improving X, as you do non-X activities, they can have positive transfer. They may improve it to some degree. They may improve it not at all. And then they may actually harm it, depending on what you're doing. One more topic to wrap up. And, and what this all leads to is the conclusion that specificity is best seen as a continuum rather than a binary is, is not. And I'll give some specific examples in part three when I talk about specific sports and, and how they are typically trained. But you can think of it as you've got your primary activity or your primary adaptation. And obviously doing that it will improve that the most, specificity. But with each step slightly or to a greater degree further away, the less of an effect you get in either direction. So if this is your primary activity, something that's similar but not quite it may improve it positive transfer to one degree or another, and vice versa. Doing this may improve the secondary activity. And then as you take another step further, you're probably less likely to get much transfer. Positively, it may become neutral. And then the further and 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 further, and further away you get from that primary activity, the less likely you're getting a positive transfer, the more likely it's going to be neutral or even potentially negative. And I'd only add to truly wrap up that negative transfer can be for one of two reasons. One, it can be because it is developing a system that is really at odds with your primary performance. Or it can simply be because it's taking time away from doing your primary activity. Somebody tells me they want to be a cyclist. I'm not going to give them two hours of, fuck, I don't know, jujitsu training. Not because that will necessarily physiologically negatively impact their bike riding but it's two hours they aren't on the bike. So now you understand specificity. Now you understand SEB, but now you hopefully also understand that specificity is not a binary is or is not. It is a continuum from most specific to less specific to very less specific to least specific to completely non-specific. And this will make a lot more sense when I give specific examples in part three. See you next time. Even though I'm not going to talk about it in this video series, you can consider psychological training under the heading of specificity, where specific types of psychological training can improve that component of performance. It brings me to the fact that the elite female powerlifter I trained, Sumi Singh, has a new book on mental training out, titled Becoming a Mentally Tough Motherfucker. How Elite Powerlifting Made Me a Better Person, Parent, and Partner, with both a foreword and epilogue by yours truly which is a guide to all of the mental training skills she developed over the eight years of her incredible elite powerlifting career. Topics include goal setting, dealing with resistance, setbacks, failures, journaling, anxiety on the big day if you do compete or have some sort of big demonstration or event, along with how to handle what happens if you choke during the event, both during and after. The book has finally been published and is available on Amazon for Kindle purchase right now. If you are in a different country, you will have to go to your specific Amazon and search on her name, which is Sumi Singh, S-U-M-I-S-I-N-G-H. You will not be able to get it from Amazon.com unless you're in the United States for Amazon reason. You do not have to have a Kindle to get it. You need some sort of Kindle reader, and Amazon does have a cloud Kindle reader to read it on the website. So if you don't have the device, don't worry about it. If you prefer physical books because you're an old fart like me, you can buy it in hard copy form as well on Amazon, and I'll put the links in the video notes. Buy it. Buy it now. Tell your friends. Tell your enemies. Tell everyone. And consider sending a copy to both Mike Isertel and little Milo Wolf. Because God help me, they both need help butching the fuck up and developing some mental toughness. Buy Simi's book. You won't regret it.
for the record. I neither read nor respond to comments on YouTube or Instagram because I don't care. And you, I don't delete comments I don't like, like most of the weak-minded babies in this industry either. If you think my content is great and want to tell me how awesome I am, fantastic. If you think I'm a dumb asshole and want to call me names, also fantastic. I don't care either way, because I have better things to do. If you have questions that you want me to potentially read and or respond to, or most likely ignore, send them to questions at bodyrecomposition.com. Might get to them, might not. It's part of my charm. Oh yeah, I recently added a playlist to my channel, my buddy Solomon Nelson, uh, who does some fantastic uh, videos taking down the cretins in this industry. I've put the link directly to that playlist in the uh, video comments, and you can also find them uh, where you find playlists. He deserves the exposure. Go check him out.